Today I want to share with you some of the things I've learned there. So let's dive in. AI is a new electricity, says Andrew Ng, a well-known deep learning pioneer. What does he mean by that? By the end of the 19th century, electricity was one of the main drivers behind the second industrial revolution. It completely transformed many industries like manufacturing, communication, and more. Um, and it eventually led to electronics and computers. And electricity literally powers our modern life. So what Andrew is saying is that much like electricity has revolutionized all these industries and our lives, AI will have a similar impact. Now, most of the current progress happening in AI is coming from a specific subfield, and that's deep learning. And deep learning is not just a hype. It's moving fast from being mostly a research field towards massive adoption in all kinds of domains. So you might be asking yourself, how is deep learning going to affect me as a developer? Am I going to be replaced by some self-writing software? Or on the positive side, can I benefit from deep learning in my day-to-day -day work? And perhaps you've also seen some of the cool things you can do with deep learning. And that got, got you interested. Perhaps you have a project idea you want to try, or you just want to play with it, see what's possible. Maybe you already have some machine learning experience, uh, but you want to see what's possible with Scala. Whatever the reason, I think it's an exciting time to get into deep learning. But getting started can be hard. There's a lot of jargon, a lot of different libraries. Most of them are research focused and written in Python. And deep learning as an engineering discipline is still young, so it's lacking best practices. So you might be wondering what's a good way to get started and whether you need a PhD in st statistics or machine learning or some similar field. And perhaps what you're hoping for is more something like this, a nice abstraction that allows you to use the technology without having to know all the details behind it. And, uh, and for software, that usually translates into having a library that hides those details behind a nice interface. Couldn't we have that for deep learning as well? Well, there's no free lunch. But the good news is you don't have to learn all the theory to get started with deep learning. For, for many tasks, it's enough to know the basics. And you can always learn more advanced concepts along the way. And it's totally possible to do deep learning with Scala. And to help you th with that, I'm going to introduce deep learning in three stairs today. First, I'm going to show you the core building blocks, the essentials of deep learning. Then we'll look at Scala as a language for building deep learning systems. And finally, we'll go through the actual steps required to build such a system. And of course, we'll apply these steps in a simple example using Scala. So let's climb the first stair, understand what deep learning is at its core. When you talk about deep learning, we usually mean artificial neural networks. Neural networks have been around for decades, but deep learning is a newer term that was originally used for larger, deeper networks. But now basically all neural networks are kind of deep, so we use those terms interchangeably. But what is an artificial neural network? Well, first of all, it's not some model of our biological brain. It's loosely inspired by the brain, like airplanes are inspired by birds, but that's all. But was it, what is it then? To gain some intuition, let's look at a few examples first. Computer vision is one of the first fields where neural networks have been applied successfully back in the 90s. But the big breakthrough came in 2012, when researchers used deep learning and challenge for image um, recognition algorithms and smashed their competition. And computer vision is still one of the most active fields in deep learning research, with many applications ranging from medicine to self-driving vehicles. Here we see an example of object detection. The inputs are raw pixels of an image, and the neural network predicts a set of bounding boxes together with a class and a confidence score. So this particular network has clearly identified my daughter as a person. It's also quite confident that she's sitting on a motorcycle. <laughs> Another very successful domain for deep learning is speech recognition. Given audio as input, a neural network predicts the spoken text. The most visible application are all these um, voice assistants like Siri, Alexa, and so on. They all use deep learning to recognize your voice. And the recognition part actually works quite well. 
The last example I want to show you is machine translation, which has seen also seen tremendous improvements over the uh, past years. Here we see the description from the Scala Days website translated to German using state-of-the-art deep learning techniques. It's not perfect, but if you understand German, you'll agree that it's still a pretty good translation. So what do all these examples have in common? Well, there are multiple things. They are all tasks that are generally easy to solve for humans, but difficult for computers. They all deal with unstructured data like images, audio or text. But that doesn't mean that deep learning can be applied to structured data. Quite on the contrary, it's used with great success for recommendations and advertising and so on. But there's another thing. And to see it more clearly, let's overlay our examples and remove the differences. Right, that's the arrow. All the examples map some input to an output. The input and output types, on the other hand, are fairly different. We can map images to classes, raw audio to text, or text from one language to, to another language. So let's make them generic. What do we get? Right, a function. And it's pure. It has no side effects, and it will always return the same result for the same input. Now, that might seem obvious, but I think it's quite important to realize what it means in terms of the generalization power of neural networks. It means that we can use them for many different tasks in many different domains. Let's be a little bit more precise with terminology. In machine learning, a model is something we can use to make predictions. In other words, we can apply it to our input to get a result back. So for instance, we could have a classifier for images, which is an instance of a model that maps an input image to a class representing the content of that image. But how do we get there? How do we implement that function? And to find out, we have to look inside the black box to see what, what a neural network actually does. Internally, neural networks operate on so-called tensors. Tensors are basically just multidimensional numeric arrays. The main reason to use tensors is efficiency. We can reduce most neural network operations to matrix multiplications and other linear algebra operations. And we can use highly optimized low-level libraries to execute these operations fast and in parallel. We can also run them on GPUs to speed up our computations even more. So internally, a model actually takes a tensor as input and returns another tensor, or sometimes a list of tensors. What we need is an encoder for the input A and a decoder for the output B, so we can actually build a model that goes from A to B. In general, we can encode most data as tensors. We encode it as binary numbers anyway, right? So, for instance, an uncompressed image already is a 3D tensor of RGB values. OK, now that we've talked about our inputs and outputs, let's have a look at the most basic unit of a neural network, the artificial neuron. Conceptually, you can think of an artificial neuron as some kind of programmable digital circuit, although it operates on floating point numbers instead of um, binary numbers. It computes a simple mathematical function from its inputs and returns a single number. First, it multiplies each input, x1, x2, up to xn with a weight. Um, and those weights determine how a neuron reacts to each in inputs. They decide how important it, each input is and how much it, its value should contribute to the output. So they are basically the programming of the neuron. Um, then it combines the results of that multiplication into a single number by just summing them up. And finally, it applies a so-called uh, activation function to that sum. Uh, there are different activation functions, but in general, they squish their input into some fixed range, uh, like between 0 and 1. The activation function is important because when, you, when we combine neurons, um, it allows us to represent more complex nonlinear functions. And this essentially enables the neural network to do conditional lo logic, um, which makes it so powerful. Now, when we, uh, or a neural network is actually just a just a collection of these artificial neurons and uh, stacked in layers. The neurons of each layer take the output of the previous layer's input and compute that function we've seen on the previous slide. 
And by doing so, each layer transforms the original input a little bit step by step up to the final output. It's important to understand that each neuron has its own set of weights, so even the neurons in, uh, of a single layer. Um, here we see a very simple neural network consisting of two fully connected layers. Um, the input layer doesn't count because it just represents the input values. And fully connected means that each neuron receives all the inputs um, from the previous layer, uh, sorry, all the outputs from the previous layer as input. And each neuron usually computes a different output because it, its weights differ from the other neurons. Now, in practice, many networks are much deeper, um, which just means they have many more layers. Uh, like, for instance, the Inception network for image recognition uh, has, I think, it's 48 layers or something like that. And the structure and size of our layers is called the architecture of the neural network. It's very important because it defines how big the capacity of the network is, how much information the network can store, and how it flows through the network. It also defines the inputs and outputs, the signature of the function. But it does, does not define the function logic itself. <laughs> that logic is defined by the weights. But how do we set those weights? Um, in order to get the function to actually compute, uh, uh, or the network to actually compute what we want, how do we program the network? And the answer is, we learn them. And that's what machine learning is all about. In traditional programming, we write rules in some way or another. Of course, we use different abstractions, languages, and paradigms, but ultimately, we write rules. And we apply those rules to some input data in order to get answers. That works fine in most cases, but sometimes it doesn't work so well, because we just don't know how to do it. Uh, recognizing faces, for instance, seems very easy for us humans, but if you try to develop an algorithm, you'll see that it's actually a very, actually a very, very difficult problem. Um, in machine learning, on the other hand, we do not write the rules ourselves. We create a system that can learn the rules from so-called training data, which basically, which is basically example data uh, with given answers. And of course, we can in turn apply those rules to new data to get new answers, like we do with our handwritten rules. But how can we create such a system that learns from data? Well, there are different approaches, but what currently powers most deep learning system in systems in production is a technique called supervised learning. In supervised learning, we essentially learn from known examples, so we train a model with examples. Known examples means some input data together with corresponding answers called labels, so that's our training data. If, for instance, we wanted to predict whether a photo contains a cat or not, our training data would look something like this. Our examples are photos showing either a cat or something different. Um, and for each photo, we also have a label. That's one if there's a cat in the photo and zero otherwise. It's important that we have a large enough training set and enough examples for each class. And how large exactly depends on the complexity of the problem, um, but more is almost al al almost always better. Um, and that's why the big tech companies that collect all our, our data have such an advantage in the field. But how does this training work? How can we actually learn a function from examples? Remember that the weights determine the function of a neural network compute, so it's the right values of the weights we want to figure out. Um, training is an iterative process with multiple steps, so let's look at them one at a time. As a first step, we initialize our weights randomly. That will give, give us a model that's pretty bad, but we have a starting point. Next, we do a forward pass. We run some training examples through the network. Here, just one for illustration, which gives us a result, a result that's usually not so good. Now, we compare the result with the correct value from the training example. We compute the difference which gives us the error the network has made, the loss. And our goal is to minimize that loss, because a small loss means the predictions are close to the training values. So the loss is our feedback signal, so and it's important to get it right. 
we can use loss as a guide to find out how we have to change uh, the weights in, to improve our model through an algorithm called backpropagation. So I'm not going to explain this in detail, but we basically compute the derivative, um, the slope of the loss function with res respect to each weight. Uh, you might remember from calculus that the derivative tells us how a function value changes when we change the input a tiny bit. And here we use that information to change the weights a little bit in the direction opposite to the slope. And that way we make the loss a little bit smaller. And now we repeat those four steps. And each time we reduce the loss a little bit and improve our model until we reach a minimum. And that method for training is called gradient descent. Um, so the loss function looks very simple here, but that's just because we only have a single, um, a single weight or two weights in the example on the right, so we can see what's going on. In reality, we have a very high dimensional space with thousands or even millions of weights, uh, and we also have more complicated loss functions. Um, so we might have to deal with all kinds of issues to get the training right. But even for deep, complex networks, the training process is just to run these four steps repeatedly. Uh, so that's, that's uh, uh, essentially how neural networks learn their function. So why is deep learning working so well? Why, why is it often better, better than other methods? And probably the most important reason is scalability. Given enough training data, neural networks can learn very complex functions. That's why for problems like computer vision, deep learning ha has outperformed many uh, other methods by far. Um, this comes at, at a price though. We need a lot of training data and we need deeper and more computationally challenging networks. So training very deep networks can be, can be hard. And another reason is composition. We've already seen that neural networks are composed from neurons and layers but we can also plug together bigger networks that have already been trained individually. And we train them a little bit more jointly and then use them like in this example, which is an image caption generator. And I think that's pretty amazing. Or we can do something called transfer learning. We can chop off and re replace parts and reuse them for, for a different task. So for instance, we can train a neural network on images of cats and dogs. Uh, then remove the classification layers at the end and put in a car detector instead. We need to train that classifier a bit, but we can re reuse most of the earlier layers. So we build small reusable functions and we combine them to create something powerful. And that does sound a lot like FP, right? And it's indeed related. Deep learning is essentially composition of dif differentiable and therefore learnable functions. And I think you can hear, hear more about that concept um, tomorrow from Noel's ta talk. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so you may heard uh, those f fears about an AI super intelligence that will soon destroy uh, humanity. I wouldn't worry too much. We aren't there yet. At best, deep learning is some kind of narrow intelligence. So there's no, no higher level reasoning involved. And you can see that quite nicely in these examples. The neural network on the left thinks there are three real bicycles and a person in, in the image. Um, you can even fool neural networks on purpose with adversarial examples. In the middle, we see what's called an adversarial patch. And a neural network recognizes this as a toaster. It does look a bit like a toaster, right? Uh, so if we place it closely to the banana, that banana suddenly becomes a toaster for the network. Okay, so that's it for the deep learning foundations. Um, and I hope I could, could give you some uh, insight into what neural networks are and how they work. Let's now climb the next stair and look at Scala as a language for deep learning. So why Scala? Building a neural network is still more an art than a science. It usually means a lot of prototyping and experimentation until we're happy with the model. Uh, so we need a language that allows us to express new ideas quickly and doesn't get in the way. But once we build a model um, that works, we of course, we want to use it in production. 
So we need to integrate it into an existing system. And currently, most deep, deep learning libraries are written in Python. So Python is great for data science and prototyping, but most larger systems are written in other languages. And these systems often run on, on the JVM. And that adds mental overhead, because we have to switch between languages and ecosystems. And with, with Scala, we can uh, actually have the best of both worlds. So a language that's concise and expressive so for rapid prototyping. Um, but we can also move our model to production with confidence, because we know we're in good company. But there's another reason, uh, which is very important, both for prototyping and production, and that's type safety. So Debugging neural networks can be, can be quite difficult because we often don't know whether bad results are caused by our, by our input data, um, our architecture, or an actual bug. Uh, we can't just write a unit test when we don't know exactly what we can expect. So it's especially important to eliminate potential bug sources up front. Um, and with Scala, one way, of course, is to let the compiler help us by providing type-safe tensor operation operations. So for instance, uh, instead of having the data type and shape of the tensor only available at runtime, like in the example above, um, we could try to, to, encode, uh, to encode them as type information where possible. So that way an, an operation can check uh, whether the input tensor matches uh, its requirements at compile time. So in theory, Scala is a great fit for deep learning, but how does reality look like, like in 2018? And I'm not going to lie to you. The existing Scala libraries are not as mature as their Python counterparts yet. That doesn't mean we can't use them. Just don't expect uh, everything to be working smoothly out of the box. So what features should a deep learning library provide at least? Um, well, we need abstractions for tensors and tensor operations. Uh, and we want them to be fast, so we want GPU support. But then we also want higher level APIs for building and training neural networks. So a deep learning library should provide building blocks for the architecture to create and stack our layers. Uh, and we don't want to think about backpropagation, derivatives, or how to do gradient descent. So a library should implement these things and let us focus on the task at hand. And then there are additional features we'd like to have, like data pre-processing pre -processing capabilities or distributed training for larger networks. So based on this wish list, I've selected three libraries I want to introduce briefly. Of course, there's more, but to my knowledge, these are the most developed ones. Um, Deep Learning for J is the oldest and probably the most mature library. It has rich documentation, a large community, and uh, commercial support. Um, but we're in Java land. So it's usable, but not always fun from a Scala perspective. There is a native Scala API on top of DL4J called Scalnet in development, but it's still in, a, in an early stage. Um, MXNet is a deep learning library with focus on scalability. It has a Scala API as part of the main project, so that's nice. Um, currently, the API is a very direct port of the Python API, though, so it's, it's really like writing Python in Scala, and so there's not, not much use of the type system. Um, then we have TensorFlow for Scala, which is the, the youngest project of the three, but it has made impressive progress over the last year. Um, it builds on the low-level parts of the popular TensorFlow library from Google, and, um, and the author has ported large parts of TensorFlow's Python API to Scala. And uh, it offers the most idiomatic and type-safe Scala API, uh, so I'll use it in my example. You can find a closer look at these libraries um, and some example code on my blog. Um, but please take these statements with a bit of caution because things are developing so fast. So enough theory. Let's now apply what we've learned so far. So the first thing we have to think about is what, what's our actual business problem, right? Um, but once we have that, um, we should check whether we even need deep learning. And sometimes the simple solution works just fine. If deep learning seems like the right approach, try to define the signature of our function you want to learn. So what's your input types? 
input and output types, what's your A and B. And let's do this with an example. So we are all excited about Dottie, right? We all heard the keyno uh, key keynote yesterday. And we want to be ready. Um, so while we have tools like ScalaFix to help with the transition of code, let's assume that someone has decided to upgrade the logo as well. So we want to replace all the images containing the Scala logo with the Dotty version. So what we need first is an object detector for the Scala logo. But let's simplify things a little bit here by making it just a classifier that recognizes whether an image contains the Scala logo or not. The next step is to look for existing solutions. If you're really lucky, there's already a pre-trained model for your task that you can just use. Usually that's not the case though, but sometimes a similar model exists like an image recognition model trained on other images. Um, then you could try transfer learning. Um, that's especially helpful if you don't have much data and you want to speed up training. Or you could build an exist on, on an existing architecture and adapt that to your task. And that could actually work for our example, but to keep things simple, let's uh, build something from scratch. So for supervised learning, we need labeled data. Remember, labeled data are examples with answers, like cat picture, cat label. Depending on your problem, there are different options to get training data. Perhaps you can reuse some existing public data set. Um, a good starting point here is Kaggle, a website that hosts data science competitions. Or you might do the labeling yourself, or, or you pay someone to else to do it. Um, you usually also have to do some pre-processing to get the training data in shape. So you might have to clean it, do some normalization, resizing, and so on. Um, and you have to vectorize it and code it as a tensor so you can actually feed it into your network. Ideally, you can build some kind of pre-processing pipeline and automate as much as possible. And you also have to split your data into training and test data. So why is that? The reason is an, an um, important issue of machine learning called overfitting. So that basically means that your model just memorizes the, the training data. Um, but what you want your model um, to do is to generalize, to work well on unseen um, data instead. So to recognize overfitting, you put aside some part of the label data and use that for evaluation. So what's a good source for Scala logo photos in the wild? Well, of course, Scala days. So I've collected about 800 photos for training from the photo collections of previous Scala days and um, pre-processed them a little bit in manual labor. <laughs> so for reading images from disk and do uh, pre-processing, like resizing and uh, adding labels, um, we could uh, use TensorFlow's uh, dataset API. The, the Dataset API allows us to build input pipelines by transforming, um, basically transforming collections of tensors. And it should look very familiar if you, you know the Scala collections API. So it has all the, the combinators or many of the combinators like fl uh, map, flat map, and friends. Uh, the main difference is that we work on tensors here. And the cool thing is that in comparison to the Python version, which, which looks very similar, um, it's type safe and prevents us from, from combining things the wrong way. The next step is to think about the architecture. Remember, a neural network architecture defines the, the capacity of the network and also defines how we con constrain the search space uh, for finding weights during training. So what works best really depends on the task you're trying to solve. Um, and, and your data. Um, you can try different architectures to, s to see how they work, but for common types uh, of data, there are major known architectures um, that, that are known to work well for, for, specific, uh, for specific tasks. And we have already seen fully connected uh, neural networks, which is the most general architecture and often a good way to start. Uh, convolutional ne neural networks are well suited for all kinds of image recognition tasks, but um, they also work well for, for other domains. And recurrent neural networks are good for um, variable sequences like text or time series data. 
And of course, it's possible, and it's also quite common to, to combine different architectures in one network. So since we're doing image recognition, um, a convolutional neural network, or CNN, is um, a sensible architecture. A convolutional, a convolutional layer uh, learns filters that you run over your image, and each filter computes a value from its surrounding pixels, and that way it can detect local patterns in the image. And if you stack multiple convolutional layers, they, they can learn to detect more and more complex patterns in, in deeper layers, like we see here on the right. So the first layer detects very simple, simple patterns like edges. Uh, the second layer already larger, a bit more complex patterns. The, the third layer seems to detect face parts already, and um, the, the fourth layer recognizes whole faces. So uh, at the end, we usually um, have one or more uh, fully connected layers um, that are responsible for the actual classification tasks. Building a neural network is basically doing three steps repeatedly. So first, we create a model. We train it on our training data and test how well it performs on our separate test data set. And then we try to improve the architecture. And we add more layers, try another type of layer, and so on. And we train and evaluate again, uh, see whether um, our changes have improved. Um, and we do that until hopefully we find something that works well. It's often useful to start very simple and try to build a minimal model first. And that allows you to establish a baseline, which is important for comparison and error analysis. And from there, you can try a bigger model, a more specialized architecture, and so on. So let's try that for our example using TensorFlow Scala. So first, we have to define our input layers. The shape of our images is here 250 by 250 with uh, three channels, color channels. And uh, the one for the labels is just a simple vector. And minus one here means just uh, means unknown because that's the, the, the batch size, how, how many inputs we process at once. And now comes the actual architecture of our layers. And TensorFlow Scala provides a set of uh, predefined layer constructors through its Learn API. And we can compose multiple layers with the compose operator um, we see here. Um, so we flatten the input um, to a um, one-dimensional vectors, and we cast it to a float, um, because that's what the fully connected uh, net uh, layers expects. And um, the fully connected layer is called linear here, um, and we set it to 64 neurons. And then comes the activation function, um, which is called value here, and that's known to work well in practice. And um, finally, the output layer, which has two neurons, one for each class. We also define a layer uh, for the labels, because we have to cast them to along for further processing. And um, then we set our loss function. And cross entropy is something that works well for multiple classes. And you can see that we use the compose operator again here um, to get a single number as a loss. The optimizer is responsible for updating our weights. So here we use standard, standard gradient descent, and uh, we also set the learning rate. That's how much we want to update the weights in each iteration. And finally, um, we create, uh, we combine these things into a, a, a model that we can actually train. Uh, so let's now run actual training on the on the example. So training can take a long time, depending on the size of your training data and the complexity of your network. So you really want to do that on a GPU, uh, except for very small networks. And we monitor how well it works. So we look at the loss, which should go, go down over time. And we also do evaluation from time to time to, uh, on the test set to see how the model works on unseen data. 
And as you can see, we make good improvements, but after some time, the accuracy starts to, to oscillate around uh, 0.75. And the maximum seems to be 0.8. So with that model, we can predict images, predict uh, whether an image contains the Scala logo or not with an ac accuracy of 80%. And that's not bad, but perhaps we can do better. So let's use uh, 128 neurons, uh, make the model a, a little bit bigger, and run training again. So that works better. So let's try even more, say uh, 512, even better. And we could probably try more, but um, there's not, not much gain um, with, with more neurons or more linear layers. So let's add a convolutional layer instead. So a convolutional layer is called a Conf2D in TensorFlow Scala, and um, we use uh, 32 filters here and set the shape of our filter to three by three, and we also add a few other uh, a few other options. We add a bias, which is basically another type of weight, and again the activation function, and um, Finally, we shrink our image with a so-called max pool operation, so we can look at larger parts uh, than single pixels in, in later layers. Um, and as you can see, um, when we run training again, oh, wait, that didn't work. When we run training again, our test accuracy increases to um, to 0.95. So our network classifies. 95% uh, of our test images correctly. And we probably could even do better, but 95% is fine for us here. So let's actually run the model. Um, so because of once we're happy, of course, we want to use it. So uh, here, here we see a, a very sim simple example, and it sees, seems to wor be working quite nicely. Um, now, I was hoping to show you a live demo here, but I actually managed to screw up my model uh, while trying last minute, improve last minute improvements. Uh, so you have to believe me that it works from the screenshots. Um, but that brings me to my next slide, um, deployment. Um, now, that really depends on our, your target environment, like cloud or uh, even mobile devices. but. It's important to understand that neural networks are software artifacts. So most of the things that apply to regular software also apply to neural networks. We have to think about versioning, testing, maintenance, etc. Um, due to the data-driven nature of machine learning, um, monitoring model accuracy is especially important. So if accuracy goes down over time, that might indicate um, concept drift, which means that newer input data differs from the, from the training data, and uh, we should do regular um, retraining on fresh labeled data um, so to keep our models up to date. So that's basically it. Um, main takeaways, neural networks are functions, and we learn them, we usually learn them from known examples. Uh, training can be challenging, uh, especially with larger networks. And Scala is actually a great language for deep learning. So if you're interested, give it a try, use one of the libraries, or get involved to make it even better. Thanks for listening. <laughs>